Prabhupada, his presence was so uh, powerful that uh, when you came in his presence, you didn't feel like you were a part of the material world. You felt that you were in, in some kind of a spiritual, transcendental environment. I didn't know about Vrindavan then, but now we'd say that we're, Prabhupada actually was bringing Vrindavan with him. And so you felt the mood of Vrindavan whenever you came with, uh, in the presence of Prabhupada. He was actually carrying Krishna in his heart. So I didn't understand that, but I felt that, just being with Srila Prabhupada. I could feel the change. I could see that here was a genuine spiritual master that was actually practicing what he was uh, preaching or practicing what he was teaching. The other people that I visited, they were ha had books and they had teachings, but then they didn't practice those things where Prabhupada was. So at that point, all these things helped to build up my faith, but then Prabhupada was very merciful and he immediately engaged me in service. He had me be an assistant to, uh, at that time his secretary was uh, Govinda Dasi, and I think Gorsundar. I forget, I think it was Gorsundar, I'm not sure, I can't remember, I think. And uh, so when they would go shopping, when Prabhupada took the afternoon nap, and I would, uh, they would have me like, a, they call it babysit or guru sit. I had to sit outside just in case Prabhupada woke up and wanted something, then I would be on call. And usually he didn't want anything. But uh, I would be there while they were out just at that time. So sometimes Prabhupada would wake up and he'd call me in and then he would, uh, he would ask me different things. He said he, always, he wanted to get a flower. This was... Uh, he said that if I get a flower every day, this will improve my, uh, this will increase my longevity. So, so he asked me, can you bring me a flower, a rose, especially a rose, not just a flower, I wanted a rose. And then uh, I was very excited, you know, here the spiritual master was asking me to bring him a rose every day. So I said yes. So then I went back to the temple and then uh, told the temple president I was going to get a rose for Srila Prabhupada. And the president said, what are you doing? You know, you're in Maya. <laughs> you can't do that. I said, why? Prabhupada told me to get him a rose. And I had phoned up. He heard me phone up uh, a florist and uh, order, you know, I was going to go and pick up a rose. And he got really angry that, you know, I shouldn't do that. But... Uh, I thought he was like imposing himself, that I'll do everything else you say, but this one thing, Prabhupada asked me to bring him a rose. I want to bring him the rose. He got very angry and said I couldn't do that, I should do something else. So I became a little angry because he was yelling at me and it was, uh, so anyway, I kind of just left the uh, temple uh, with the vibrations ringing in my ear and I was walking off and I got to like a dead end where the road it didn't go any further. And nearby I saw there was a florist shop. And that whole time I was just, you know, I wasn't able to think. So I walked in the florist shop. I thought, well, I'll get a rose. And the person said, oh, here, I've been waiting for you. Here's the rose. Turned out it was the exact shop that I'd called. But I'd forgotten the address and everything. So then I went back and I saw Prabhupada and bowed down. I offered him the rose and he took it. I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> One thing that that really s struck me is one of the first letters Sri Prabhupada ever sent me was when he was in India and I had that tremendous desire to take care of him when he came back. For those, those three weeks had really changed my life. Uh, spending three weeks with him after he got out of the hospital, I, I really wanted to continue serving him in that way. And so the whole six months he was in India, I was praying to Lord Jagannath every day that if he comes back, please let me, please let me be his servant. Please let me cook for him. Please let me clean his room. Let me do anything. Just let me be near him. Let me serve him and be near him. This is my very strong desire. And so I got a letter from him. And in the letter, the last statement was, I know your mind. Just, I know your mind. 
also with that building in Detroit, when Prabhupada walked, this is Deva Sadam Mandir, when Prabhupada walked through, he had no money at the time, you know, for this particular project, he had no money. And it was a gorgeous, gorgeous building. In fact, we didn't know what to do with it. There was a, um, uh, a painting in the front lobby of all these naked women bathing. So all the sannyasis, they were all, you know, you know, everyone trying to be proper about things. Prabhupada looked at it, said, looked, turned to the men, said, very nicely done. Then they came to where there was a big polar bear rug, you know, the kind with the head and the teeth and everything. So Srila Prabhupada looked at it and very gingerly took his cane, put the tip of his cane in the mouth and lifted up and looked at the teeth. And very wide-eyed like a child, he turned to Jagadish Maharaj and said, they eat men? And Jagadish Maharaj said, sometimes Srila Prabhupada. So Prabhupada put it down and made a wide berth as he walked around the rug and it was just very sublime. Prabhupada said at one point, the man was asking, I think, million something or close to a million dollars. Prabhupada said every room is worth a million dollars. In fact, it was even designed, there were three archers. They used to have a, what they used to have the ballroom dancing and they had where the orchestra was. There was two small archers and a large arch, just like we do for Jagannath, Radhakrishna, and Gornitai. And even there were carved peacocks, there were uh, uh, lotuses, everything was carved, like ro- you know, uh, everything was designed. Prabhupada said actually this rich man Krishna engaged him in building this building for us and has simply been lying, waiting for us to come pick it up. So Prabhupada was very, he had a vision for the building. So he walked through the whole thing, just like he could pull the money out of his bead bag. Just, you know, price wasn't even an issue. Prabhupada was talking about this and that. So finally outside there's a sunken garden and uh, they were sitting in the grotto area, their nice sun, everything was very peaceful. And the man was a very greedy man. He was like a real money grubber guy. You could just, you could, you know, see the grease on his fingers, practically speaking. So when he sat down, and here was Srila Prabhupada, loved the building, and Prabhupada's, you know, sublime uh, aristocratic nature, that, that Prabhupada could just write the check. So Prabhupada said, this building is perfect for our purposes. Every room is exquisite. It's exactly what we want. He said, very aristocratic building. So the man was like, you know, could taste the money. And Prabhupada turned to him and said, but we are not aristocrats. He said, we are professional beggars. Therefore, you should give it to us. And I thought the man was going to have a cardiac arrest, you know, at the point he was like, ah, ah. So Prabhupada actually toyed with him. There's a whole story how Prabhupada toyed with him back and forth. And ultimately, Prabhupada got the building. The man actually tried to cheat us. Um, after we got it, uh, Ambrish gave half the money, I think. And then uh, Lake Shavanti, Lisa Ruther, gave half the money. And this way Prabhupada was able to, although he had nothing, outside of his desire, and Krishna arranged the building and Prabhupada picked it up. And got a, no one could believe the price Prabhupada got for it. In fact, the man, we got a call from a neighbor that after the papers were signed, that the man was stripping the building. He was taking all the uh, mirrors off the walls, all the doorknobs, all the fixtures, all the light, you know, because everything was very opulent. He was stripping whatever he could. So we actually went and stopped him. He had one truck there. And we said, you know, how can you do this? He said, I can't help. He said, your Swami cheated me. So uh, Prabhupada, they told Prabhupada the story later on. That's when one, one of the times Prabhupada said, yes, Prabhupada said, I am a Calcutta boy. So he'd met his match with Srila Prabhupada. I remember one time he was giving a lecture and he was, the whole lecture saying how we had to be 100% Krishna conscious. We had to be completely surrendered to Krishna 100%. And he was just ramming that point home. And at the end of the uh, class, the devotees were kind of, you know, very serious and looking down as if he could read their minds uh, that, uh, you know, 100% who could come up to that standard. So then he looked at them and now he kind of relaxed his mood a little bit and he said, well, if you can be 90% Krishna conscious, then you can also go back to Godhead. And then... uh, He started to slightly turn to prepare. It was a very big Vyasa sun, and he was very high up. It was maybe four feet in the air. It was <clears throat> so he had to go down steps to get down the Vyasa sun. So he was just starting to turn, and then he said, "Even eighty percent, even if you're eighty percent surrendered, Krishna will still take you." So then he turned, and he was he got down the Vyasa sun. And he was walking away, and his he has chadar, his uh, his robe, the chadar was uh, flowing, 
with one hand and then uh, it was dragging on the ground and he just kind of looked, stopped at the devotees, looked at the devotees and then he said, even if you're 70% Krishna conscious, still Krishna would take you in it. He threw the chatter over his shoulder and walked off with his head very high in the air. One thing that I do remember very clearly was he said this a few times when I brought the plate in, you know, and there would be sabji, rice, dal, chapatis. He would say, this is so amazing to me because when I was in India, everyone said, oh, Swamiji, don't go to America. In America, there will be no food for you. You'll starve. They eat only meat in America. Because back here, we're talking back in, in 25, 30 years ago, there wasn't that much interchange between India and America. So was, they, would, they would tell me, don't go there. And so I simply said, what is that? I shall live on bread and potatoes. And so I thought I would live on bread and potatoes, but now I see Krishna has sent everything. Dal, rice, chapatis, all sabji, everything. And he would say this quite like a number of times, how he was so amazed and happy that Krishna had sent everything, just as if he were you know, in India. And he had, he, but he thought that he was just going to live on bread and potatoes here. There was another time, I didn't personally experience this, but uh, Karanda told me the story, because he would come back every morning from the walks. Probably was walking in L.A. in Shevet Hills. And there was these big houses, and they walked past one hill, uh, one house, big house. Prabhupada said, someday we'll have a big house like this for Krishna. The devotee said, Jai Prabhupada. So then Prabhupada walked a little further, and there was a big circular driveway and a big car, big, you know, stretched limb or something. Prabhupada said, someday we'll have a big car like this for Krishna. The devotee said, Jai Prabhupada. So they walked to the, another house a little further, and out of nowhere this dog came running down the driveway and stopped. And Prabhupada said, Someday we'll have a big dog like that for Krishna. The devotee said, Jai Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, you fools, what do you want a big dog for? <laughs> so not like a parrot, you know, the devotees seeing their innocence, you know. The night he had the stroke was a very traumatic experience. Um, Jadarani and I were perched by the window looking in to the room. There was a window between his living room and his bedroom, you know, it was an arch window in New York. And he was very weak. And still he would have the boys, Satsrup or Brahmananda or whoever was there, they would take turns. They would sit him up and open the Bhagavatam and he would continue teaching and continue reading the story of uh, Prahlad Maharaj. Even though he was, I mean, I'm saying he was apparently suffering or he was apparently at a very critical time hovering between life and death, he didn't care for that. All he cared about was, he only cared about teaching us. And I never saw such selfless love. I was uh, deeply affected at that moment. I realized a lot of things. I saw really pure love. I saw how much he loved us, and I realized that he wouldn't be with us very long. And I made a vow that I would do everything I could to take care of him and help him and do whatever I could to make things easier for him. One devotee had told me that one thing you should do is you should always try to ask and tell, you ask questions to Prabhupada, but you should think a little bit and every time he gives a class, ask a good question. So, since I had that advice, I, I, every time at the end of a class, I'd always ask a question, trying to think of something that was in the class. And then sometimes uh, Prabhupada would... Uh, I remember one time I asked a question about Radharani something, and said, who are you to ask about Radharani? Or then sometime I would ask... I, I mean, every day I would ask questions. And so it would be a regular... Uh, I would ask questions and then Prabhupada would respond and he would respond every day in a different way. So then one, then we had to work, uh, we had to go outside and work to maintain the Montreal temple. There was no source of income. So I would miss the evening class and I would be able to just come to the morning class. But the next day I'd listen to the tape. So the one time I was listening to the tape and at the end of class Prabhupada said, anyone has any questions? And nobody had any questions. And he said, Jai Pataka or Jay or whatever, I forget. Anyway, 
whether I was initiated or not, I don't remember. So he asked nice questions. So that was like a big thing for me. Otherwise, uh, Prabhupada didn't praise uh, disciples normally to their face. He would always be very grave with the disciples. But sometimes you'd hear that he would comment to other devotees and you'd hear it through the grapevine. So this time I heard it on the tape. Someone told me you should listen to the tape. This is an Indian professor and he was saying, uh, he was all one, you know, and Prabhupada was explaining there's a source and there's byproducts. It's not transformation, it's byproducts. And Prabhupada said, I, Prabhupada said, if I say cotton ball or cotton shirt, is there a difference? And the man said, yeah, cotton ball, cotton shirt, it is. You know. Prabhupada said, if I say cotton ball or cotton shirt, is there a difference? And the man said, cotton, it is. You know, he was going on like this. And Prabhupada, he said it three or four times. It was a low, you know, Prabhupada suddenly sitting in a room at a low table, and the man was sitting on the other side. Prabhupada reached over, grabbed the man by the shirt, and shook him and said, if I say cotton ball or cotton shirt, is there a difference? And the man, he got it. It wasn't just, he didn't just get it to be polite. He, Prabhupada actually shook through his, you know, dull cow brain, you know, a, a buffalo brain, and the guy got it. There, there's a difference, cotton ball and cotton shirt. However, after the, and it, it was friendly, and the, you know, the man could do like this. But after the man left, Prabhupada pointed out, Prabhupada said, this is the special sanction of old men and little children. They can go anywhere and they can say anything. So we, and he said, you cannot imitate. So don't, you know, brahmacharis don't try this at home. I remember I was uh, in a morning walk with Srila Prabhupada and he was, uh, he just stopped by the side of a church. He looked at it and he said that uh, in the future our ISKCON temples are going to be something like the churches that there'll be some devotees in the temple, but there'll be many devotees who live around the temple. And they'll be coming on, uh, on the weekends or the festivals. And at that time, there's only uh, maybe a dozen or, I don't know, maybe 1970. I don't know exactly how many temples there were, but there weren't that many temples. And the whole mood was making temples and joining the temple, being a temple devotee. But here Prabhupada was saying that in the future, the temples would be more like a center and there'd be big communities around the temple of people worshiping Krishna in their home. So that I, was, uh, I always remembered that because, of course, now I have to do a lot of, I, I'm doing a lot of coordination of congregational program. So that instruction really has a lot of uh, importance to me now. In, uh, but at that time, I didn't really know what to think of it. It was just like, prediction or something. I know, I know once when we were in New Jersey, a funny thing happened. We, we used to sit and all eat. He would sit on the sofa and he would eat on a little table in front of the sofa and we would sit on the floor and we would all eat uh, there. And uh, we were talking about, we'd talk about different things during the meal. And so I remember one time we were talking about brown rice, white rice, long grain rice, this rice, that rice, and I was and and there and he was saying uh, how his servant there was one servant that he had that didn't like the long grain fine rice. His taste was for the lesser quality rice because that was his taste, you know. And then we were talking about he was saying how brown rice is for the animals. And so I said, well, I must be an animal because I really like brown rice. And he just laughed. He just laughed and laughed and laughed because it was such a simple, it was really done in a mood of simplicity, you know, but he really thought that was funny. When Prabhupada was, there's a part, after you go through the park and the kind of the museums and everything, there's a part you come through, it's all forest and it becomes a little quieter. And I'd walked there many times, devotees had walked there, we'd never seen this. When Prabhupada came, all the deer came on both sides of the walkway, of the, of the you know, there's like a forest on the side, and, and they walked with us. They'd run ahead, maybe 20 yards ahead, and they would wait. And then Prabhupada would catch up, and they'd run ahead, and they would wait. And they followed us all the way down and all the way back. It happened twice when Srila Prabhupada was there. Two, the two times, the only two times he walked. And one of the devotees quoted the Atmarama verse, that even the dull animals can appreciate, you know. And we were thinking, how, how, what is the status of Srila Prabhupada? That he's like, like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. No, we were not doing, you know, make some Sahaja thing, but, but like Prabhupada, like, like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they could sense here was a pure person, a fearless person. I remember many things that happened when Prabhupada was in Montreal. 
Like we'd go on, a, we'd walk to McGill University or walk around the block and Prabhupada would stop and make observations. One time he stopped, one time he was saying that if you see a very healthy person, someone who's like very big, then you can ask him, where does he do his grocery shopping? Because obviously he must have a good source because he's healthy. And this so happened that a taxi drove up and let somebody out and the taxi driver came out and he was very big. Then Prabhupada said, yeah, go ask him, where does he do his shopping? <laughs> the Prabhupada was just very spontaneous like that. And then so the devotee went over and asked him where he did his shopping and the taxi driver, of course, kind of bewildered why someone was asking where he bought his groceries. Oh, well, in the very beginning, uh, in New York, before he, he got ill, we, he had us working on a uh, story of Prahlad Maharaj and Hiranyakashipu. And so he was describing to us, he wanted, he was really keen on having this into a slideshow for children. And um, this was his vision, which eventually manifested. And uh, so he had us working on this, and he would tell us all about the poses. He would pose, he posed for Hiranyakashipu on one leg, and he used to pose for Lord Nishingadev, and he loved to pose for Lord Nishingadev. He would come in at least once a day and do a roar. I mean, he would come in and describe how Lord Nishingadev and his eyes would get big, and you could see the white up above <sighs> coming out of the column. This was this was his delight. He he enjoyed this very much. And once uh, once Jadarani had him uh, pose, uh, he wrapped a dhoti, a white dhoti, you know, and then into a threefold bending posture, you know, so that we could see how the pleats fell. So he posed like Krishna, and uh, he was very, uh, you know. He was right there watching us, seeing what we were doing. He would come in and, and uh, see how we were doing it. And so one day they said that in Montreal they found there was a cockroach in the, uh, in the quarters. So then Prabhupada took the cockroach up in his hand and opened the window. And then uh, he told the cockroach, Here, I'm giving you the whole world. Now you can enjoy it. <laughs> and he threw the cockroach out of the window and closed it. I remember Prabhupada in Los Angeles when I was there. How he used to, he was trying to teach us every morning the Sanskrit. It was, Shri, it was Sri Shapanishad in the mornings in LA. And, uh, you know, Om Purnamada Purnamidam, like that. And we would stumble along and nobody would get the verses. You know, they wouldn't. So after some time, like maybe a week, Prabhupada, and he would st sit back and he would wait for us to say it and we wouldn't say it, you know. Or we would stumble, and, and maybe, I think Jayatirtha, a couple of people were learning. So Prabhupada said, these books I'm writing, he said, they're not just for selling. Prabhupada said, they're for you, you should learn this. So he was very, and he went on how we should learn like a, Prabhupada said, like a lawyer knows the law books, we should know. There was another time Prabhupada was reading from Krishna book, and uh, sometimes he would, he would add, he would read in the evening, he would add things that aren't in the text. Like he was describing how, um, when Narada Muni comes and warns Kangsa that Kangsa is waiting for the eighth son to be born, so he's letting the other sons go. And Narada Muni was like catalyst. He wanted to speed up the appearance of Krishna. So he, Prabhupada was describing. So Prabhupada said that Narada Muni showed him how to count. Narada Muni said, you, okay, you're thinking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But what if you count this way? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the first becomes the eighth. Or what if you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the set? In this way, by doing all these things with his fingers, Kangsa became bewildered that any son could be the, be the eighth son, and then he wanted to kill them all. Once I had these, uh, there was this picture of Prahlad sitting in the boiling oil, and so I had to, you know, come up with some demons. Like I never, I didn't know what demons were like, so I think I probably dug them out of a Hieronymus Bosch painting, you know, here, you know, this. Somehow I got these demons in there. And so I, I asked Prabhupada, you know, after I did them, you know, got them drawn in, were they okay? And he says, oh, yes, yes, this is very good. And he says, there are such demons, they are like this. And uh, uh, he's, he's saying, yes, even on, this, even on this planet, there are such demons. And I said, oh, really? I didn't know that. And he looked at me and he said, there are a lot of things you do not know. So then somehow we got one uh, doctor had just built a brand new house which he was going to make into a clinic and no one had moved in it yet. So he thought that, okay, I'll give it to you for six months 
it'll be auspicious. Some sadhus will come and stay in my new clinic, my new house. So then we had a place to invite Prabhupada. So in the meantime, Prabhupada had left America and gone to Japan. So we sent him the message that now we had a place for him separate. So then Prabhupada said, okay, I'm coming. And uh, we made a big reception in the airport in Calcutta. We had the newspapers, we had uh, all the media was there. It was a big event. In fact, uh, a whole truckload of uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava devotees came for a chanting kirtan to receive Prabhupada. Then uh, <coughs> we were asked to go and invite everyone. Before Prabhupada came, we went around and invited all of his god brothers who would like to come to receive him because here he was a, like a conquering Gaudiya Vaishnava missionary who had spread Krishna consciousness in places where no one had ever even ventured to go before and was coming back successfully. And one godbrother, Puri Maharaj, he said, oh yes, I would like to go. But when he said that, it's, I didn't really know much about the internal workings or the the politics or whatever that was going on between the different Gaudi and Mutt, uh, people. But the one uh, Grihasta devotee came up to him and said, no Maharaj, how can you go? You are an older godbrother to him. You took initiation before he did. You took sannyas before he did. So you cannot go to him. He should come to meet you. I said, you know, it's kind of strange. I mean, what does it matter if you're initiated a few days earlier or later? Someone had done such a wonderful preaching. So in the end, no, uh, none of Prabhupada's godbrothers actually came to the airport to meet him. But some of uh, disciples of his godbrothers came to meet him. So Prabhupada noted that he was not very really happy that none of his godbrothers came to meet him. And then one of the godbrothers' uh, disciple invited that your godbrother is waiting for you at his temple. He has a feast for you there. So he wants you to go from the airport to his temple. And then Prabhupada, he like became very uh, grave. And then he said, uh, let us go in the car. Of course, before that, we had a big reception, a press conference and everything, and there was an RT in the VIP lounge. He didn't have to go through any customs, immigration. He went straight to the VIP lounge. And then when he came out, we had a big, uh, it was a, for a Cadillac, actually. Somehow, one life member had a Chevrolet or Cadillac, a very big car for India, American car. And so then Prabhupada went in that. And then they invited that you come to the uh, temple of his godbrother. When he went in the car, and then he said, uh, take me to your house. I will not go to that temple. You can go later and bring the prasadam that they've made and bring it to the house. You go straight to our house. I remember Achutananda was in India at that time, that we were in Montreal. This one just comes to my mind. Achutananda was in India at that time, and uh, he uh, was there with a, a young Brahmachari named Brishikesh, I think. I can't remember what his other name was. Anyway, somehow or other, this boy had gone to the ashram of Ban Maharaj and taken reinitiation from Ban Maharaj. And Prabhupada was extremely upset. I didn't really understand why, but he explained to me, he said, uh, of course, this boy is an American boy. This American boy is a fool. He doesn't know anything. It's not his fault. He's just a foolish youth. But Ban Maharaj, he is responsible. He, he knows that this is... Uh, what he is saying by doing this is he is saying that I am not a bona fide spiritual master. So he was extremely upset by this. I actually had never seen him that upset because uh, it was dealing with a kind of Vaishnav etiquette uh, that I didn't really understand. And Tejas told me a story that uh, when Prabhupada came to Delhi, he hadn't been in Delhi for a long time, and they had a reception in the airport. and. Um, I think the mayor was there and so many big life members and they had a big RT and they had the Vyasa-san in the airport and everything. Prabhupada came and he came to sit down and they were just 
Tejas was just about to garland Shila Prabhupada. Everyone was there gathering. Prabhupada said, stop. Prabhupada said, what was... And everyone's listening. Prabhupada said, what was the collection last month? Tejas said, some number. Prabhupada said, how much did you send to my book fund? And he gave a number which was 50%. Prabhupada said, begin the RT. That's the first thing Prabhupada said. He wanted to know. He wanted to make sure 50% was going to his book fund. We were invited to some Bhagavad Gita conference. It was sponsored by one of the disciples of Gandhiji, Vinoda Bhave, in a place called Wardaha in uh, Maharashtra. And he's a very famous. Vinoda Bhave was like one of the most famous uh, saints in the Gandhi tradition. And uh, all big political leaders would go to meet him. And he was trying to uh, protect the cows from being slaughtered. That was like one of his last campaigns. But somehow he was having a big conference on the Bhagavad Gita and he invited Prabhupada to come. And he invited many other sadhus to come. So I was there for that, uh, for that conference. And uh, they were all sitting in a very raised seat and Vinoda Bhava had many uh, women disciples who would chant whole chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. And then Prabhupada, he had international devotees, men and women, and there were other uh, Mayavadis who had uh, their disciples. So Prabhupada, uh, Vinoda Bhave had his disciples sing the Bhagavad Gita and he spoke something. Then Prabhupada had us chant Hare Krishna. We were all chanting a big kirtan and everybody was rocking and clapping their hands and they were getting into the kirtan. Then Prabhupada delivered a very nice lecture. And afterwards there was one Mayavadi sannyasi and uh, it seemed like he was upset that Prabhupada's kirtan and the whole, everything was having a, a big effect on the whole crowd. So then, normally he would just give a Bhagavad Gita class, but now he wanted to do a kirtan also. So then he told the people, you should all chant with me, we'll do a kirtan. And he just, it seemed like he was just speculating some mantra right on the spot. Maybe he chanted before, I don't know. But it was a very unusual mantra, something sat. Chitananda Basudeva Satchit Ananda Gobindam Sam Um Tat Sat And then, you know, it was just like really strange, you know, and nobody was really getting inspired by the mantra, but he was like trying to chant it. In the middle of Prabhupada, he just said to the devotees, Chant Hare Krishna again. So they're right in the middle of his, you know, Mayavadi Kirtan, the devotees just jumped up and with Kirtan, Kartals and Madranga drums. They just started chanting and everybody was kind of relieved because that was the most strange chant they'd ever heard before, you know, in their life. So then they all started chanting with Prabhupada. <laughs> and there was a Caltech professor who introduced himself as a professor from Caltech and who had studied Vedanta and appreciated that Prabhupada had given a um, simplistic presentation appropriate for the neophytes in the West. But the further one went into Vedanta, one could understand how it form becomes formless and the, you know, all, you know the whole thing they give. And he, you know, quoted a little bit, he knew a little Sanskrit, he knew a little this and that. And Prabhupada sat, Prabhupada didn't even look at him. He was standing, there was a rug there and everyone was sitting on the rug, big rug, and this man was standing. Prabhupada didn't even look at him, Prabhupada was just looking at the deity, Radhakrishna and chanting, he was saying, hey, Krishna, hey, Krishna, 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 And the man went on, went on. Prabhupada didn't even look, you could see Prabhupada's noble profile, you know, like a lion. You could just see he was like a lion. Prabhupada said, hey, Krishna, hey, Krishna, Krishna. And the man finally ran out of steam, you know. Prabhupada said, are you finished yet? And the man said something, you know, Prabhupada, he, he, there was like an intimation, the man could see that, you know, maybe he'd gotten into something. Prabhupada turned and Prabhupada said, in this Purana and in this Veda and in the Vedanta Sutra and this Upanishad and this Samhita and he was just like hammering a nail into the ground. The man just, you know, it was like body blows and then finally the man was kind of, he was stooped a little bit and then he was like on his knees and then finally he was, you know, he was like, if he could have melted into the floor, he would have melted into the floor. And Prabhupada had his hand in his bead bag and Prabhupada was making point after point after point. And then Prabhupada finally came to a crescendo and he finished. Prophet said, you have, do you have any further question? The man said, Swami, can we have kirtan? Because that was his complaint, you know, that we're just chanting and dancing like sentimentalists. And Prabhupada just, in the door, he's, Jai! Prabhupada just transcendentally, you know. 
the man had seen the light, so to speak. Harsharani wrote a poem and sent it to Prabhupada. And I, of course, would open his mail and sit there and read his mail to him. And this poem was pretty bizarre. She said, I offer my humble obeisances to my spiritual master, who is, I'm just the gist of it, who is continuously running here and there, playing hide-and-go-seek with Krishna and the cowboys, who is always in, absorbed in uh, hide-and-go-seek and leapfrog and describing so many cowherd, so many leela pastimes. And uh, Prabhupada was sitting there and says, Ah, she has become advanced. Publish this poem in Back to Godhead. And it was printed in Back to Godhead. I was there also when some devotees, uh, we went with Srila Prabhupada when he was seeing Indira Gandhi. And he had, uh, he had uh, a list of uh, things he was going to discuss with Indira Gandhi. But then Indira Gandhi said that uh, she was very upset because the, prime, the president of Bangladesh, who was the founding president, Mujibar Rahman, he had just been assassinated in a coup. So she was very upset. But uh, she made time for Prabhupada to see her, but first time she gave was the Thursday afternoon. So Prabhupada, he didn't really uh, consult much with astrologers or anything, but he followed that don't have a really important meeting on a Thursday afternoon. He considered that it was not an auspicious time. That was one of the, about the only astrological thing he really uh, observed. So he said, uh, if I have to meet her at that time, then I don't want to meet her because I'd meet her in the morning or in the evening, but not in the afternoon. So they changed the time to a time that he approved of. So then we all went together and uh, but uh, we got just to the door where Indira Gandhi came and met him and then he went in alone and talked with her. So later we came back and so she was very respect, respectful to him and uh, she asked him actually, well how do you know that your followers are not CIA agents? And then he had to explain that, you know, I went to the West, I preached, these people are sacrificed everything, they, they gave up so many bad habits, they're getting up at four in the morning and attending Mangal Artis. And you know, if they were CIA, they'd go live in five-star hotels and they would have a whole different lifestyle. They wouldn't be vegetarians, give up all these habits. So then she was convinced and then she said, all right, so I'll give you, uh, I'll give so many of your devotees, I'll give them long-term visa. Because there was a problem then, they weren't giving us visas. So then in India after that, she passed some order and we all got, uh, those who needed visas, they all got visas. So <clears throat> the temple president was always trying to save money and he wanted to fry everything in peanut oil. And you know the devotees, we all wanted ghee and this and that. So <clears throat> the temple president used to go up, I think once a week they would go up and have lunch with Srila Prabhupada. Some, once a, there was some arrangement they would meet. So Durlab was his name and he asked Srila Prabhupada, Laguna Beach was the temple, he asked Srila Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, and we told him, we, we went on like a non-violent, non-cooperation strike. We said, no more peanut oil. And so uh, he said, well, I'm going to ask Srila Prabhupada. So he, so he asked Srila Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, can we cook in peanut oil? Prabhupada said, isn't that so first class? So later on in the conversation, the man said, he said, Srila Prabhupada. Durlab asked, you know, wove it in again. But what, what about cooking in peanut oil? Prabhupada said, peanut oil is fifth class. And finally he asked a third time, you know, later on he said, well, Prabhupada, something about peanut oil. Prabhupada said, Cook in, anything, cook in anything you like. So the temple president heard that. Oh, great, I can cook anything I like. So as he was leaving, you know, Prabhupada said, Prabhupada said, but, Prabhupada said, I know one, I know one thing. I said, I know one man, how do you say? He said, I know one man who, uh, who ate too many pakoras cooked in peanut oil. That was it. I know one man who ate too many uh, pakoras cooked in peanut oil. And so the devotee said, oh, what happened to him? Prabhupada said, he died the next morning. <laughs> so that was the oh, Prabhupada's purport on peanut oil. That more or less went out the window on that one. One very nice thing which happened, one day we were in Mayapur, we were walking through the fields and then Prabhupada would always have us, uh, he'd ask me to sometime lead the way through the fields because there are just these little narrow paths between the rice paddies. And so then uh, he said, these are like the little highways in the fields. So then he said he wanted to go to the Ganges and he went down to the Ganges 
At that time it was in the winter, and so the river was very low, and the water had become very clear. Normally the Ganges has, uh, is like a little saffron color, slightly muddy with a reddish uh, hue. But now the, the flow had reduced so much that you could see the bottom, it was clear. It was very rare to see the Ganges like that. So then Prabhupada said, let's take a, a bath. And then the secretary said, well, Prabhupada, we don't have any gamchas or towels or anything. You know, we just came for a walk. And Prabhupada looked around and said, well, there's no women here. You know, we can just go in our copans. And then I have a top piece, I can wear this. So then he took off the top piece and put it on. And uh, all the devotees, uh, brahmacharis and sannyasi, just went into the Ganges. And then Prabhupada, uh, he did something I never saw anyone do before. It's like when he was dipping under, he closed all the holes in his head. He put, I won't be able to speak when I do this, so I just give a demonstration. But he put well, two fingers over the mouth, two over the nostrils, two over the eyes, and the thumbs in the ears, like this. He took three dips, and then he came out. And then one devotee got a little excited, wanted to put water on Prabhupada's back or something, but then he kind of looked, and then it was getting like too familiar. So that, but it was a, uh, it was very, uh, I don't know what to say. Very, it was very ecstatic <laughs> to just suddenly have that kind of a spontaneous uh, bath with Shri Prabhupada. There was no way to get into the Mela because there were 20 million people there. There were no train reservations. You'd have to have your own helicopter. And there were no buses. It's like people were coming in, you know, lying on top of trains and stacked against the walls of trains. And, and uh, his doctor had said that he couldn't fly and the devotees didn't want him to go, but he was determined. He was going to go to Kumbh Mela. Everybody told him not to, but at the last minute he made his own decisions. And so, miraculously, there was one sweet Indian gentleman named Mr. Gupta who had just joined about two months prior. He just happened to be the chief engineer of Indian Railway. <laughs> and so what he did was he added two cars to the trains. This is not done in India. I mean, totally unheard of. But he added a first-class car and he added a second-class car. And he not only that, he arranged that Prabhupada's car was freshly painted and there were garlands hanging in it. And he arranged for his personal servant to go with him into the Mela, you know, to drive with him. And we had just given uh, our money, you know, I was traveling with Kusha and her three-year-old son, and we gave our money to Mr. Gupta. We didn't know, but we had a coupe right next to Prabhupada's. And then while we were on the train, it dawned on me, oh, he told me he was going to take me to the mail, and here we could, you know, this, the coupe right next, you know, his coupe with the, his sannyasis and brahmacharis he was traveling with, and then the next coupe, they're like little rooms, an Indian train, where we could hear him talking at the stops, and uh, sometimes we would take grapes or take mangoes or things into him. And of course the train stopped <clears throat> outside the mela, because the train station during Kumbh Mela is a nightmare. It's just like, you know, they're usually a nightmare anyway, but they're more of a nightmare with thousands of people. And so we stopped outside uh, Allahabad in the dark, and we got off the train, and Hans and Duda's buses picked us up, and of course Prabhupada's car was there, and then we drove into the Mela in that way. And then while we were in the Mela, <clears throat> Prabhupada was wanting milk. There was no way to get milk. So I talked to Mr. Gupta, and Mr. Gupta arranged for a cow to be brought to our, our um, compound in the Mela so that Prabhupada could have fresh milk. Mr. Gupta was wonderful. He, was, he really arranged for everything. And then um, <clears throat> he arranged for the, a train to pick Prabhupada when he was ready to leave the Mela. From the Mela he went to, uh, I can't remember whether he went to Calcutta or Bombay. Anyway, he left the Mela. Um, they picked him up outside this 
train station. In other words, they made a special stop for the train. Two cars were put on the train from Bombay, all the way, empty cars, all the way to pick him up and then take him out of the mail. I mean, this is just like, um, uh, in India this would be considered a miracle because, I mean, the roles of bureaucracy just to get a train ticket. If anybody's been to India, they know. But to have two whole cars put on just for him, you know, and, and because there was no other way he could travel, he couldn't fly. Well, sometimes he'd be sitting in his room in Calcutta, and then I remember one time he was explaining, one of the life members said, well, can you show us some miracle? And uh, Prabhupada said, well, some, uh, some uh, yogis, they show a miracle of, uh, they give some rasgula or sweet or something. He said, I went to America with forty dollars, with forty rupees, rather, and now we have temples all over the world in this short span, which are worth more than uh, 400 million rupees. So isn't that a miracle? And they thought for a minute, and the businessmen were calculating, said, that's a miracle. <laughs> so we're walking along these big houses in Lakeshore Park, Shevet, uh, in uh, Chicago, and this dog looked like it was half, you know, horse. It was like Marmaduke's older brother. It was this enormous dog, like Aristosura coming to Vrindavan. The ground was shaking, and this, oh, this huge dog came running down like this. And so, uh, you know, three or four devotees hid behind cars, a couple of devotees hid behind Brahmananda. More or less, everyone just, you know, was on, I don't mean this like it sounds, but more or less was overwhelmed by the temporary bodily concept of life and was of self-preservation. And Prabhupada was really left out sort of in front as the point man. Some people were there, but they were stunned. So everyone was like, didn't know what to do. And Srila Prabhupada, in his transcendental bravery, he stepped forward, threw his charter over his shoulder. I was thinking like Krishna, you know, ties his belt before he attacks, you know, fights with the demon. Prabhupada threw his charter over like that, took his cane and went, HUT! And this huge dog just turned, and went back like that. You know, the boys kind of dusted themselves. They were a little embarrassed. He kind of regrouped. And then a little further down the road, another dog came out. And so I forget one sannyasi, somebody tried, hut! And the dog just got madder. And Prabhupada laughed, Prabhupada said, you have to know the science. We were walking on, on, uh, near the Jalangi River one day, and Prabhupada, uh, one, one villager, he came with a big uh, basket of uh, vegetables on his head. So then Srila Prabhupada asked, uh, so you're going to sell those? In the market, he said, yes, yeah, so well, how much will you sell? You sell us the whole basket. And he had just been telling the devotees how I like fresh vegetables from the garden and we should offer our vegetables to the deity. And if you buy wholesale, how you can save money. Here a man came with a basket on his head. So then Prabhupada immediately set up a bargain, bargaining with him. And he started telling, look at if you go to the market, You'll spend the whole day sitting there with a the basket. I'll buy it from you right now. You can go and do something else. You don't have to walk two miles to the market and sell your goods. So like this, he bargained him down to maybe six rupees for the basket. And then said, so, okay, you go to the temple, and uh, here's a chit. Give him a note, and they'll pay you over there. So the man went off with the basket and went to the temple and sold those vegetables. And then that was what they cooked for the deities in Prabhupada that day. In New Jersey, we were sitting in the garden one day, and there was a slug. That's an ugly thing. You know what a slug is? It's an ugly thing with that, like a snail without a shell. And it was crawling there right next to him. And I said, ooh, look, you know, I was a kid. And, and, and he said, he got this look of tremendous compassion on his face. And he said, chant to the poor creature. And so he had me sitting there chanting to this slug. You know? And now I still chant to slugs, because I remember Prabhupada telling me to chant to the slug, and when I chant to slugs now, or little insects or whatever, I know that, that he's, this is one of his instructions, that, that we're given this human form of life and we can chant, and they can't, but the soul can hear, the tree can hear, the bird can hear, the you know, everything. And this is, we would sit outdoors and he would talk like this. I can remember once he was showing, he was talking about two butterflies that were flying together. And he's saying, just see, there's family life also in the butterflies, you know, they're, you know. 
and we were on the beach in New Jersey, and uh, there are little um, ants on the beach and stuff, you know. And uh, he was saying, they say there's no life on the moon, but here on the beach we see there's life. There's, there's life in every part of God's creation. It's continuously seeing, constantly viewing the world through vision of Krishna Bhakti. There's no, I mean, there was never any time that he wasn't. One time, I remember, one Maharaj was cooking of hot puris, and we were taking hot puris with date gore, with date molasses. And then Prabhupada was looking through the window and seeing everybody, the sannyasis and brahmacharis around getting hot puris, and then taking, you know, one after another with the date gore. Then he said, this is not uh, very good for sannyasi life. There was a big, um, there was a big statue of an eagle, like a, like a, I don't know what, like an American eagle or something. It was a commemorating some returning from World War II or something like that. So Prabhupada went out of his way to look at it, and there was a, was a lamb around it or something. It was like some sheep or something. And Prabhupada said that there's a type of bird that flies from one planet to another planet. And Prabhupada said it is so big, it, like, it, like it just flies from planet to planet. And it picks up an elephant, will pick it up and then drop it. And it kills the elephant and then it'll eat the elephant. What can I say? Prabhupada said it. We were there on the walking front just because he saw this eagle statue. And then he went on to describe the abominable snowman, how the abominable snowman is a big demon, you know, um, living in the mountains with big footprints, and how there are all these various entities in the, uh, deep in the ocean and up in the mountains and in the dark jungles of Africa. There are all kinds of things. You know, when you're fresh out of school, you think the scientists that, that everything that's there has been discovered and it's all been taught in uh, History 101 or Anthropology 202 or whatever. But he made it very clear that that's not the way it is, that there's a lot of things that we didn't know about. And, of course, we accepted that, you know, his, his view of the world. But it was just very interesting to see uh, the things that he would come up with. In uh, New Vrindavan, Prabhupada was um, sitting out on the on the lawn, and we, I was a temple president in Ann Arbor in those days. So you know, temple presidents we got to sit there. And uh, <coughs> some some man had come. He was a neighbor. And you know, West Virginia, right? Almost heaven. Well, that almost is in capital letters. I assure you, but. Uh, this man was a simple man, and he showed up, and he just, he was a retired judge or something, and he heard the Prabhupada was there, he pulled his pickup truck, got out of his pickup truck, walked right up to Srila Prabhupada, said, got something for you, Swami, and plopped this grocery bag on Prabhupada's lap. And you know, Prabhupada, on one hand, he was very large, you know, he had a presence that he could fill the whole room, but in reality, you know, you were close to him, Prabhupada was not actually that very tall, and he was very delicate, actually. So we had Prabhupada sitting there, and this big gar uh, grocery bag was on Prabhupada's lap. He just plopped it right there. So Prabhupada reached inside. It was full of vegetables. Prabhupada pulled out this zucchini. Prabhupada and he showed it to everyone. Prabhupada said, when someone brings you something from their garden, that is love. So the man with this big, rough hillbilly, had, you know, and when Prabhupada said that, the guy got like tears in his eyes. He couldn't believe it, you know. In Hawaii once, there was a couple who came to visit him. And this particular devotee was very good at making, he was a sculptor. He had helped me make some deities. And Prabhupada wanted him to make some deities, I think Panchatattva deities. He went to, on and on to explain to him how he wanted him to do it and so forth. And spent quite a bit of time explaining it all to him. And then after the conversation, the boy asked him if it was okay for his wife to make silk, to kill the silkworms to make the silk. And Prabhupada was like, he, he, after they left, he was saying, these Western boys are so creative. Next they will be asking me if they can kill cows to make mudangas. One time, one of the big ministers, he was the number two person in the uh, state government. He was the home minister. And he came to see Srila Prabhupada and his family, his name is uh, Tarunkanti Ghosh. His family is a uh, family of Vaishnavas. 
his grandfather used to was the one who said that Bhaktivinoda Thakur was the seventh Goswami. He had written a book about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So now his grandson had become a, a big politician. He was the editor of a major newspaper also. So he came to see Prabhupada. And when he came, he went right behind Prabhupada's desk and he went to grab Srila Prabhupada's feet. So at that time, Brahmananda was going to come and then he was, looked like he was going to go and jump on him. <laughs> and then Prabhupada, you know, you know, here the home minister is the person who's in charge of all the police, all the everything, you know. He said, no, no, it's all right. You know, like <laughs> 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 and uh, he just came and grabbed Prabhupada's feet and just put his head on his feet. <laughs> you know, like Prabhupada, what could he do? There was, when, when Prabhupada would sit in his garden, we planted, one of the reasons I went to Laguna Beach was to, we jackhammered up the back of the patio and made a garden there for Srila Prabhupada. And I would do some, I would do some gardening there um, after it was set up. So Prabhupada would sit in his garden and he would read in the afternoon, he would come in the evenings. We planted some jasmines underneath Prabhupada's window. It's actually nice, you could hear that karate in the back, but with that open window, the jasmine would come in the window there. And so Prabhupada would come out after it had gotten cool and he would sit and he would read with sannyasis and temple presents and stuff, he would read. And we would all go upstairs, which I guess now is the, whatever that room is, maybe they use it for plays or storage or stuff like that. And we would look out the windows into the garden and you'd be like a whole gallery of devotees. And Gargamuni would look up and he'd say, get, get up, you know. So uh, he got real heavy with us that we couldn't be up there. Look, he was bothering Srila Prabhupada. So finally he broke us of our habits and no one would look out that window. So the first day that no one was there, Prabhupada looked up and said, where are the devotees? So Gargamuni, they said, well, Gargamuni said, you know, they shouldn't be there, probably. Go get them. So all the devotees, we'd all sit and look out the windows and Srila Prabhupada in the garden, like, Prabhupada liked it, the devotees were there. So he was looking through his paper. They showed Prabhupada the paper about the moonshot. And on the front, you know, one small step for man, one large step, you know, for mankind, or whatever the propaganda line was. So Prabhupada looked at that, he looked, Prabhupada was flipping through, and then Prabhupada got to about the fourth or fifth page and there was a whole thing about how taxes were going to have to go up for the moon shot or pay for the space. Prabhupada said, this is their real business. That they're just, they've made some scam and just to squeeze money out of the innocent public. So Prabhupada said, this is their, their real business is squeezing money and this is just some sideshow on the side like that. So Prabhupada's comment on the moon shot. I can, I can remember one of the most uh, persistent memories is this the sand crab story. And this took place in Hawaii many years later. But again, we were walking on the beach, and he was talking about the sand crabs. There's these little white crabs that, as you walk down the beach, they run and hide in their hole. You know, they run sideways. You've seen them, I'm sure. And he um, he went on and on for days about the sand crabs. And what he was saying, uh, finally, it dawned on me that. Uh, he was saying that there is no such word in the Vedic, in Sanskrit or in the Vedic text as instinct. That instinct, why is the sand crab running? This is the, you know, this is the kind of conversation, why is the sand crab running? The sand crab is running away due to instinct, they would say. His instinct is to go into its hole. But he was saying that there is no such thing as instinct, that instinct is a word that's been coined by the scientist to cover up for the fact that there's super soul, there's God, and there's past experience. And he, he went on and on to explain this in detail, and finally it dawned on me that I've been taught Darwinism all my life. And I didn't even know it, even though I've been a devotee for, at this point, maybe eight years or whatever, seven years or something, that um, Darwinism is what we're taught in the schools. We're raised this way, we were raised to think that Everything is operating on instinct, the birds are doing this, the beasts are doing this. But Prabhupada was like blasting this philosophy day after day with this explanation. He, he went into detail with me. He said, supposing, he asked me, supposing you know where is the privy. The privy is the bathroom. It's just in there. Now, supposing you come into this house 20 years from now. Because you were here 20 years ago, you know the privy is there. Similarly, you've been in the body before, many lifetimes, so you know that as soon as you 
open the eyes, you look for the mother's breast. The, the, the little animal is nudging for the mother's breast. So similarly, it's the past experience, the past lifetimes, and it's the guidance of the super-soul within the heart that guides the living entity. It's not instinct. There's no such thing as instinct. Instinct makes no sense at all. It's a word. What does instinct mean? It means nothing. And if you stop and think about it and you analyze it, you see it means absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And yet the scientists have convinced everyone that the whole of nature is moving by instinct. But the whole of nature is not moving by instinct, it's moving by super soul. You can throw food outside and in, within 20 minutes the birds will be eating it. And they'll say it's instinct. But it's actually the super soul is guiding them, oh there's food. You know? And so this is the kind of talks that, that, he, would, that he would get into. One time he was very uh, strong with me and he was uh, like chastising me or giving me some strong instruction. And the next time I came to see him then he had changed his mood and he said, I'm sorry uh, that uh, maybe I dealt with you too harshly or, he's, or no, he said, how did he say it? He said, I'm very hard, I'm a very hard person to tolerate, I deal very harshly or something. And I couldn't believe that Prabhupada was saying, you know, it, such a thing to me. And then I said, "No, Shila Prabhupada, it's I was who was I was offensive, and uh, there was no wrong on your part." When we were living in Los Angeles, uh, when he would take his nap, or um, I would usually sit and read Chaitanya Charitamrit. We had a copy that was translated by some scholar that Gorsinder had gotten. It was like seven little volumes. And uh, we would sit and uh, I, would sit, I would sit and read it, and Krishna would also read it too, and uh, while he would take his nap. And so he would come in and he would say, Oh, what are you reading? And we would say, This is Chaitanya Charitamrita. And you know, he saw that we were really interested in this book, Chaitanya Charitamrita. And uh, so he decided that he would translate it also and make a good translation. And so he engaged Gorsundar in the transliteration work. And I started typing the, uh, transcribing the tapes uh, for Chaitanya Charitamrita because he he wanted to uh, he wanted to give us that you know since there was a he could see it, we were very eager to to read it. Bahulasa was encouraging Srila Prabhupada about uh, that they had this they'd set up in front of Berkeley the Ber you know, UC Berkeley they had a prasadam stand. And they were selling Bengali sweets. And he was going on and on about this. And Tripurai was there. And Prabhupada stopped and Prabhupada asked him, he said, um, uh, how many books did you sell? What was the story? Because Tripurai told him, and some amazing figure, Prabhupada said, this is the real Bengali sweet, Chaitanya Charitamrita. There was one really interesting thing happened, that when we were... Uh, we moved to the new building in Mayapur, where he was staying in the third floor. But the building was not finished. The toilets were not completed. The piping hadn't been connected. So we had to personally empty the toilet. There would be a bucket there. And the toilet was there, but there was just no pipe. And there was, he came all of a sudden, and it wasn't ready. So we had the service to go, and who could empty out the remnants or whatever, the refuse. But one day, Prabhupada started calling out, Jaya Pataka, Jaya Pataka. And uh, I don't know why he was calling out, so I ran to the bathroom. And in the bathroom, Prabhupada was holding the door semi-shut, and there was a snake, a venomous serpent was stuck in the uh, in the border of the of the door and it was trying to bite Srila Prabhupada and it was leech leaping out and just coming and missing him and he was holding the door so by the pressure of the door he was like the snake was being slightly crushed so that uh, he would couldn't get loose so like Prabhupada was like this and holding over here and the snake was half, you know, this much it was out of the door and he was trying to get Prabhupada. And so he was like, 
he had called for me, and then uh, you know I saw the situation. So then, uh, somehow I got Prabhupada out of there, and with a stick or something, we 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 hit the snake out down, and we got Prabhupada out, and then uh, this is a very uh, <laughs> unusual circumstance, and all of a sudden. And afterwards, like Prabhupada was, yes. <laughs> and he never lost. He was just, you know, I mean, it was an urgent situation, so he was calling, but it was, uh, it was never that he was always uh, under the circumstance, a cool and calm, and never lost his. Uh, then he was trying to. Find out where the others live. Said so if there's one, there must be two, because they always go in pairs. You know? We could never. The, the other one disappeared down the hall, and we could never find it. One one thing I was thinking, uh, he was sitting on the rooftop of the Honolulu Temple once, and uh, getting a massage, I think, by Sri Kirti, and. The rooftop of the Honolulu Temple faces the back of nu Nuanu Valley, which is very beautiful. It usually has a rain cloud about the color of Krishna, and it usually has a rainbow, one or two rainbows. It's a very beautiful, beautiful area. And so that day there was a rainbow, and he became very poetic, and he started talking about how the rainbow has the three colors of the material nature, the red for the passion, and the yellow for the satvagun, and the blue for the tamagun and how the, all the modes of nature are coming from these three colors, just like on the artist's palette, red, yellow, and blue are the primary colors, and all the other colors are made from those. He was saying how these three colors in the rainbow, these three colors, of the, those three gunas, all the various mixtures of gunas the living entities are in are coming from those three. It was very poetic and very beautiful. Actually, Prabhupada was walking down uh, the stairway in Calcutta, and there were many devotees, I think, like Tamal Krishna, and so many different devotees were there. And uh, Prabhupada was going down the step, and it, his, his step slipped a little bit. It looked like he was almost going to fall down the stairway. And one of the senior devotees said, Watch out, Srila Prabhupada. And then Prabhupada just stopped and looked, and he said that, it is your responsibility to watch out. You have to take care of the body of the spiritual master. And the spiritual master will take out, will look out for your spiritual well-being. But as far as whether I fall or not, that you, that you have to guard against. The Prabhupada, but he turned to Akendra, um, Rupanuga's son, who I guess was maybe seven or eight. He said, Akendra, lead Kirtan. So little Akendra, you know, he plays, he was dead, you know, Nama Om and Shri Krishna Shay and Hare Krishna like that. When he was done, Prabhupada called him over, reached into his dhoti, and gave him a $10 bill, $5, $10, something, said, buy yourself a red fire engine. And Prabhupada said, children like the color red. I have one photograph at home of Prabhupada sitting and holding a globe and turning the globe around. It's a color photo, and he's, he's saying, Brahmananda will go here, Gargamuni will go here, it, describing, he's just turning the globe and at all the countries. And here we are, a handful of teenagers, mind you, who can't even get it together, to, don't even know how to brush their teeth or whatever, and he's got it all in his mind with this globe that he's going to send us all over the world and open centers all over the world. And he was extremely interested in Russia. He always talked about Russia, and he always wanted that Russia should receive the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. Uh, we were walking in a morning walk with Srila Prabhupada in, uh, in North Calcutta. And then uh, Srila Prabhupada just said, oh, here's a life member. He was a very wealthy man. For some reason, Prabhupada wanted to just stop in at his house. So he, he walked in, and uh, the servant came out, and he said, tell your master that uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami is here. So then, uh, after some time, the servant came out and said, Babu puja kotahai, that the, the master is doing uh, puja. He's doing worship of his deity. 
he'll be here after some time. So then Prabhupada just commented that Krishna is more pleased when the devotee is served than when he's served. And that if this person was a more advanced devotee, he would appreciate it that here a spiritual master has come and left his deity worship to receive the devotee of Krishna. But because he's thinking that his deity worship is more important than receiving the devotee of Krishna, this shows that he's a neophyte or a Kanishtadikari. The Jehovah Witnesses came to visit once in Los Angeles. And so Prabhupada said, let them in. So I let them in. And they sat and they talked with him in his room. And they were preaching, you know, their philosophy. And apparently it, they believe that within this body, I, I don't really know their philosophy that well, but within this body you will become liberated and this body is eternal. And Prabhupada kept asking him, with this body? With this body? <laughs> like he was just incredulous that they could actually believe that this body was eternal. And so, but he was very polite to them and very nice and he didn't really preach to them. He just wanted to know what they're teaching here in this country. And uh, so then uh, as they left, he had me give them a little brochure. And there was a drawing of the universal form that I had made and it was a little brochure describing Chan Hare Krishna had a picture of Lord Vishnu on the front with all the arms. And so he asked me to give them a copy of this as a gift, because I think they gave him some literature too. And then the next morning, whenever he went out on his walk, he saw that it was on the street, had been run over by a car. And he was really disturbed, and he said, oh, we should not give out such freely. You know, he was distressed that the Lord's picture had been run over by the car. There was one time a, a thief who was a con artist who dressed like a sannyasi, and he started collecting in the name of Iskhan. He gave himself the name of Chutananda. So he was known amongst devotees as a Chutananda number two. And uh, he was based in uh, Rajasthan, and around Jaipur he was uh, collecting money. Somehow he got receipts, he copied receipts, rubber stamps, the, everything you needed to collect money. He even made up a big uh, plan for building a temple. And he is going around and getting donations from people, saying he's a Chutananda, and uh, it's for ISKCON. So some of these uh, people appeared in Bombay and uh, said, yeah, we were made a member by a Chutananda. Were your life member with Chutananda in Jaipur? Chutananda at that time was in Hyderabad or South India somewhere. So then they sent a few devotees up to find out who was this a Chutananda. And then they located that he was actually a thief. And he was uh, stealing from people in this way as a con artist. So somehow they got him to go to see Prabhupada who was in Mayapur. And Prabhupada had called the, all the, the, like the equivalent of the FBI in India, the CID, the chief of the district police, superintendent of police, and they all came. In the meantime, Prabhupada talked with this person. This is a Chutananda number two. And he, <coughs> after talking to Prabhupada, he said that you are a great uh, spiritual master, a saint. I feel changed after talking with you. So I want to surrender at your lotus feet. I'm going to surrender my life to you and do whatever you say. I'm giving up all my bad ways. So then Prabhupada called in all the big police officers that came there to take this person away because there had already been cases registered and everything. And he said that I have to give this person asylum because he surrendered to me. As a spiritual master, if someone surrenders to me, I have to give him shelter. And there where you know how police are, they're like ready to just dive in on him and you know, take him away. And they were like, he said, well, Guruji, you know, what can we say? But we don't believe this person. He's a thief, you know. He's a, so what can I do? If he surrenders, then I have to uh, accept. But he told that person, if you follow, you're safe. But if we find that you want to escape and leave, I'm going to turn you over to the police. So he gave that uh, person some, some service to do. He had him do some writing for him and kept him engaged. But after about, I don't know, a week or ten days, 
Some devotee spotted him in the Mangalarti time trying to leave from the front gate with his bag. So then he went and grabbed him and brought him over to Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada said, I gave you a chance. You said you were surrendering, but now you're revealing that uh, you are not actually sincere. So then he called the police and said, okay, now I'm giving him over to you. But later on, <coughs> some man was saying to Srila Prabhupada, and one devotee, Prabhupada, when I joined, I was only 18 and a half, and I made so many promises, and it was easy for me to follow the principles. Now it's so many years later, and my life has changed. It was going on and on, and like, and Prabhupada slammed his hand down and said, then why did you promise? He said, only an animal can't keep his promise. So heavy. Uh, well, no, it was later that day he was talking about how the Western boys and girls, oftentimes, they are, um, they go to the other side. The problem is they go to the other side. And I said, Srila Prabhupada, what do you mean by the other side? You mean back the way they were before? And he said, yes. Because he was talking about how some sannyasis had left and become as, you know, the tendency when devotees stop doing devotional service is they go to the lifestyle that they were living before they were a devotee. So he's saying they, they go as they were before. And I said, uh, so you mean they go back like they were? And he said, yes. Therefore, many of them will have to take birth in India to finish their Krishna consciousness. One day in the, when we just moved into the, the Lotus Building, the first uh, multi-story temple, guest house, where Prabhupada's uh, quarters were, when we moved from the grass hut to that building, then uh, there was a very big feast. And uh, we invited many villagers and everyone to come, gave a big feast. After the feast was over, the, all the leaf plates were thrown behind the uh, temple. And then Prabhupada went upstairs to his room. And I was sitting in the room with Srila Prabhupada, and then there was a dog's barking in the back. So Prabhupada got up and walked over to the veranda and looked over the uh, veranda. And there he saw that there was this big pile. I mean, so many people had taken prasadam. There was a very big pile of uh, banana leaves, which are the organic uh, way that you eat in India, you know, off a leaf. And there were some young, uh, some children who were obviously very poor. They had, you know, torn clothes. And they had sticks in their hand. And they were beating off the dogs to get the remnants of food that people had left on the plates and thrown in the garbage pile. And when Prabhupada saw that, how they were, he saw that, you know, I mean, what a scene to see human beings have to fight dogs off to eat, you know, the, 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 the throwaways, the, the spittings that people have thrown away. When Prabhupada saw that, literally he started to cry. Tears were coming down. And he just said, just see how hungry they must be. I mean, who would, you know, stoop to that kind of a situation to fight off dogs, to eat, you know, things that other people had thrown away. So he was really moved that these children are so hungry. And he said, we have to organize that nobody within a 10-mile radius of the temple is hungry. Everyone should have uh, food to eat. So that's when he organized. This. Initially it started as the ISKCON food relief. Later it became food for life. And he wanted that uh, there should be a regular program of distributing prasadam on a, <coughs> on a weekly basis, two days a week. And we started uh, all seven days in the week we were distributing. Five days for little children and pregnant and nursing mothers. And seven days was uh, simply for anybody without any discrimination, whether they're Hindu, Muslim, Christian, or anyone men, women, young, old. So that, and Prabhupada was so moved when he saw that uh, people were hungry like that. Yeah. And before going back to Hawaii, he began to speak about compassion. And when he would speak about something, you would experience it. It was like a transmission or something. And he began to speak about compassion and he began to speak about how that 
his eyes were closed and there were tears running down his cheeks. And he was saying, people are suffering in this world. He was expressing divine compassion for all the souls suffering in this world without Krishna consciousness. And he was saying, please go and teach them. Uh, tell them about Krishna. Tell them, give them this, this knowledge because they are suffering. They don't know they're suffering, but they are suffering. And he became in such a mood of compassion that tears were coming down his cheeks. And he was uh, just showing how much love that he had for all the jivas in this world who don't have, who don't know about Krishna. Krishna Kirtan Gana Natana Pano Premamritam Manidhi Dheera Dheera Jana Priyav Priyakaravu